Welcome to the Daily Horror Habit Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Krieger, bringing you daily reviews of currently streaming horror movies for your twisted pleasure. Be aware that these reviews may include mild spoilers. And as always, I hope you enjoy. Consistency and quality are the keys to maintaining a cinematic universe's relevancy. Universal Studios' failure to abide by either of these severely undercut their attempts at rebooting their Dark Universe series. But where most saw failure, writer and director Lee Winnell saw opportunity, and gave us one of 2020's scariest films, The Invisible Man, which is currently streaming on video-on-demand platforms. Elizabeth Moss stars as Cecilia, the victim of an abusive relationship with the brilliant, but psychotic optic specialist Dr. Adrian Griffin, played by Oliver Jackson Cohen. Cecilia barely manages a midnight escape from Adrian's abuse, but leaving him is easier said than done. Two weeks after her escape, Cecilia receives word that Adrian has committed suicide, but she still can't help feeling as if someone is watching her, that perhaps Adrian isn't actually gone. And the problem is, no one will believe her. As strange occurrences become more and more frequent, Moss's pleas for anyone to believe her grow more profound, leading those around her to call into question her sanity. The brilliance of Winnell's remake is his giving H.G. Wells' original story a 21st century touch-up, which makes its titlier villain a more plausible threat. The experiment gone wrong in the original Invisible Man is replaced with Adrian developing a Black Mirror-esque invisibility suit. His uncontrollable insanity is replaced with him being a manipulative and abusive spouse. The 2020 film is presented in a way that makes the outlandish premise of the original a far more palatable concept for a modern audience. He isn't just a mad scientist who made himself invisible. He's a genius scumbag who isn't finished gaslighting his ex. Some may find the concept of literally humanizing the monster and grounding him in reality to go against what the Universal Monsters originally stood for which was big and terrifying literal monsters. But The Invisible Man shows Winnell's ability to make a 70-plus-year-old film feel relevant in our current social climate and actually quite terrifying. The film is still very much about a monster. It's just a very believable one. First and foremost, The Invisible Man would be devoid of the emotional weight it has without Elizabeth Moss's powerhouse performance. Moss impresses throughout as she continually delivers raw and powerful emotions of a psychologically and physically abused survivor. From the opening moments of the film, you feel Cecilia's trauma in Moss's frighteningly convincing portrayal of a broken woman. Winnell makes the film's thematics of overcoming trauma, gaslighting, and more importantly, believing women front and center to the experience. The biggest difference from the source material is that the Invisible Man is not the protagonist of the film. We're in Cecilia's shoes from the outset, exploring her character's inner struggles within the fiber of her being. They're executed on so resoundingly sincerely that the film would work as this purely psychological horror, devoid of an actual invisible man. This is the biggest compliment I can give the film's first half, as while it takes its time to get going, it's very much a believable and grounded depiction of a woman overcoming her trauma. Her fear is palpable, and to the degree that it'll have you looking over your shoulders though you yourself are being stalked. Given that Cecilia is being stalked by a literal invisible man, Some may fear that this would result in a substantial amount of scenes of her talking and interacting with, well, no one. And to a certain degree, this is true. And yet, it doesn't end up mattering, because Moss's versatility as an actress is so strong, she can carry a scene where she's talking to an empty room, or another character. Our understanding of her character, her pain, her eventual acceptance that she herself will have to stop that which is threatening to harm her, is incredibly powerful. It's awe-inspiring to see her range as she goes from downtrodden, to terrifying, to physically fighting a foe she cannot see. Cecilia's character arc is as powerful as it is cathartic in her unwavering determination to prove her sanity to the friends, family, and law enforcement who doubt her at every turn. This groundwork of establishing her character is so vital to making the second act, when the Invisible Man actually makes his presence known, pop as well as it does. Thankfully, the duo of Winnell's direction and Steven Ducio's cinematography bring the Invisible Man to life in memorably terrifying fashion. Through weaponizing the audience's fear and paranoia of empty spaces, every scene is filmed with nerve-fraying tension. Extended frames that linger on shadowy, empty doorways and rooms that we assume to be vacant are instead filled with unease and dread. You can't help but meticulously scan for even the slightest movement, despite searching for a foe you cannot see. You believe you know when and how Adrian will torment his victims, but Winnell skillfully subverts those expectations. Winnell also smartly scales his scares from minor, innocuous occurrences to irrefutable in-your-face moments. An object moves unexpectedly. Something goes missing. The beginning of the film focuses on Adrian using his invisibility to tear away at the foundation of Cecilia's life, fully displaying his predatory behavior. He steals her portfolio work that she needs for a job interview. The food she's cooking suddenly erupts into flames. It isn't until Adrian's back is against the wall and in danger of being found out 
that he truly goes off the rails and onto a bloody rampage. The film's meticulous pacing ensures that when the monster finally does, quote unquote, appear, it's always shocking and totally unexpected. I recently rewatched The Invisible Man, and despite knowing when the scares were coming, the crafting of them and the tension leading up to them made it feel like the first time all over again. I was also pleased by the film's substantial body count, which is more personal compared to the original 1933 version. In the original, The Invisible Man essentially becomes a supervillain, robbing banks and derailing an entire train, sending its passengers to their deaths. In the remake, Adrian kills those standing in the way of his one goal, reclaiming Cecilia. Without divulging too much of the later portion of the film, I will say that there is a particular fight with a handful of cops that is brutally efficient in highlighting just how terrifying an invisible predator would be. In spite of its more personal body count, Winnell never allows the film to carry itself like a slasher. Rather, he focuses on capturing the unexpected and deliciously sinister lengths that Adrian goes to get his property back. The film's ability to continually make each of its scares impactful is largely thanks to its pulse-pounding score by composer Benjamin Walfish, a smart blending of somber classical strings and intense 21st century synth short-circuit riffs for when the Invisible Man actually strikes. Again, on a rewatch, the impact fullness of each strike by Adrian is given added weight due to the sudden and piercing electrical short-circuit riff. This drives home the technology aspect, portraying Adrian as almost inhuman, given his suit's abilities. It complements Winnell's modern-day take on this classic extraordinarily well. Dare I say, the film's score is perfect? It heightens every moment from the emotional uncertainty of Cecilia's plight to the unexpected ferocity of the Invisible Man's attacks. And now here's some half-assed research I did moments before recording. The film had actually been kicking around since 2006, bouncing from different writers to different directors to the final creative team that we got. As recently as 2016, Johnny Depp was attached to the project. And while I'm not especially partial to Johnny Depp, the idea that you would remake this film and not have the focus be on Cecilia's story the entire time kind of detracts from what I think the possibilities of reviving these types of monster movies would be and why I think Invisible Man is so successful in what it does. Obviously, if Johnny Depp, this mega star, was to play the Invisible Man, I feel like they would have to have such a large focus be on him. Whereas the actor that they got, he's no known and he's a great actor. It's just that he's not as much of a mega superstar. So it really is Elizabeth Moss's character's focus, basically, for the narrative. And I think the film's that much stronger for it. All of the fight scenes with the Invisible Man before we start to see a little bit more of his suit was filmed with green screen, basically. So a stunt coordinator would be in a green screen suit and he would be wrestling and fighting with Elizabeth Moss's character. Uh, the behind the scenes footage is actually pretty funny to see a guy in a green suit kind of just wrestling around with her and throwing her around the room when she's attached to wires and whatnot. So I highly recommend that you guys uh, go check that out and look that up on YouTube. Winnell said he wanted to get really weird with the music. And I think that, again, the sound design and the score in this movie are stellar in that without it, a lot of the kind of tension that is built around these em mostly empty sets just wouldn't work as well as it does, given how reliant we are on the music and the audience's paranoia. The music and sound design really kind of fuels that and plays into that in the best way possible. Before starting the project, Moss and Winnell agreed before starting the project, Moss and Winnell agreed that the number one thing is, is that the movie has to be scary, which, given that it's a horror movie, sounds kind of stupid. But the idea is, is that there's so much of an emphasis on other things for the first half of the film than in-your-face scares. And it's not even really an in-your-face scare kind of movie. It's more about focusing on the fact of this abusive relationship and how that can manipulate people and it can destroy people even when one of the perpetrator or the perpetrator of that abuse is supposedly dead and how we see the psychological effects that that can have on somebody being in a relationship like that. If the film was just these kind of seeing a handprint on a window or seeing things move for two hours and five minutes or two hours and ten minutes, it just wouldn't be as impactful. And I think that this dedication to focusing on the relationship is, like I said, it makes these moments where the invisible man actually shows up like pop that much more and be that much more effective. In an interview with Film Inc. magazine, Winnell was asked if he could do another Universal Monster movie, which one would it be? And Winnell said that he would be interested in doing a Wolfman movie because he feels that werewolf movies haven't been done the proper justice that they deserve in a while. And if The Invisible Man is any indication of his ability to revive old IPs, I'm all for it. And finally, in an interview with MTV International, Oliver Jackson Cohen said he covered Moss's trailer with photos of himself as a joke. Moss never addressed it, kind of ignoring it. And I think it's interesting because this was done as a joke and not with any malice intended, 
But when you start to think about who Oliver's character is, it is very much something that like a narcissist would do. And I'm interested, I would would have followed up after being told that, like, do you think that has anything to do with your characters have any effect on the characters' relationships, given that one of the characters is a narcissist, overbearing, abusive to his spouse? And seeing how that affects his spouse, I think, is uh, one of those things that it definitely would have could have had another meaning or had another impact than just a joke between the actors, which I thought was pretty interesting. You know, initially I was a naysayer. Despite a great admiration for Winnell's 2018 film Upgrade, another Dark Universe reboot attempt didn't initially fill me with confidence. How could they possibly hope to succeed here when, in my opinion, they failed so miserably with The Mummy, Dracula, and The Wolfman? three of the most iconic monsters of all time. And within the opening moments of The Invisible Man, I realized my hesitation was completely unwarranted. The film's palpable intensity, suffocating tension, and savage violence are successfully blended with Moss's burning desire to escape, to free herself, and in doing so, reclaiming her dignity. Watching her core emotions and Winnell's stylistic nuances grow into a horrifying nightmare of cat and mouse was nothing short of breathtaking terror. The Invisible Man is the breath of vitality needed to rejuvenate Universal's stagnant dark universe, and is without question, it remains one of the year's best horror films. I highly recommend this for those that like their home invasion films with a supernatural twist. And that'll do it for another episode of Daily Horror Habit. I'll see you guys tomorrow for another horror movie review. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Daily Horror Habit podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to Daily Horror Habit on your preferred streaming service. And follow at Daily Horror Habit on Instagram or at Daily Horror Pod on Twitter.